Welcome to another episode of the Michelle Tafoya podcast. Please subscribe. Just click that little subscribe button on whatever format you're listening to so we can always be downloaded onto whatever device you want and you never miss an episode. We appreciate it. You know, I'm a big freedom of speech advocate. And if you think that they're only coming for hate speech, you're absolutely incorrect. There is a lot going on in the world right now in Brazil with barring tweets on X. I don't know if those two terms are ever going to be separated, but our guest today had a tweet banned in Australia. uh, And if it it wasn't taken down, there would be a massive fine to pay. What was his egregious tweet about? Anti-child mutilation. I know some of you may be pro-child mutilation. I'm firmly anti-child mutilation, as is our upcoming guest. His name is Chris Elston. He's really known as Billboard Chris. He's a courageous guy. You're going to love this information that he shares with us. It's a remarkable, he's been through a lot of stuff. He's had his arm broken by a mob. So listen to what happened in Australia. Last week, Chris Elston, a Canadian anti-gender ideology and anti-child mutilation activist known as Billboard Chris, was shocked to have been notified by X, formerly known as Twitter, that the Australian government had demanded the removal of one of his tweets. The Australian government has what's called a, um, an e-safety commission, meaning electronic safety, like internet type stuff. Uh, now some Australian MPs have spoken up about the government trying to censor his opinion about all this stuff. He has plans to fight back. Elon Musk has plans to fight back. We're going to help him fight back by exposing you today to Billboard Chris and his extremely controversial message. You're going to love this. Stay tuned. Welcome to the Michelle Tafoya podcast. You know, after a long day, no one wants to spend an hour in the kitchen making dinner. Well, how about quick and easy barbecue? No, I'm not talking about takeout. I'm talking juicy steaks, succulent chicken or fish, and healthy grilled veggies cooked on your own Solaire Infrared Gas Grill. Solaire grills are the hot, fast grills that heat up to a 1,000 degrees in just three minutes, even in the dead of winter. True. And that heat locks in juices and flavor and grills your food faster. It's a veteran-owned company, multi-generational family business, and each Solaire grill is made in the USA out of quality commercial-grade stainless steel. It will be the last grill you ever need to buy. Visit besthotgrill.com for their free guide, How to Choose the Right Infrared Grill. For apartment balconies to backyard entertainment areas, that's besthotgrill.com. With a hot, fast Solaire infrared gas grill, you'll want to grill every single day. Get your free guide at besthotgrill.com. That's besthotgrill.com. On Twitter and X, whatever you want to call it, you can see him as at Billboard Chris. I'm just going to call him Chris for now. Chris, welcome. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you so much for having me today, Michelle. We've been on, I've been on a big journey the last few years, so I'm looking forward to telling the audience about what's going on with the whole business of trying to change the sex of children. It's, it's, uh, you know, I think our biggest exposure to a transgender person was formerly Bruce Jenner, now Caitlyn Jenner, right? Uh, An Olympic decathlete, gold medal winner, hero uh, back in 1976, and then you know, went, had children, got married, had a family, and then decided he was going to continue his life as a she. And to great applause and acceptance and all the rest. But this was a grown man who had lived with something for a long, long time and made this decision on her own. I should, I don't want to misgender, um, Caitlin, but now Chris, we're talking about little kids. And you hear a lot this argument that, well, if it makes a child happier, why would you deny them the opportunity to change not just their gender, but their sex? How did you get involved? How did I get involved in this discussion? Yeah. Well, I'm a dad of two girls and my main job in life, like all parents, is to be a good dad, be a good custodian, send them off into a sane world. And I don't like the world that we're sending our kids into anymore. I'm not going to send my girls into a world that doesn't know what a woman is 
And I'm not going to send them into a world that's trying to change the sex of children just because these kids are distressed about something. So you had mentioned something really important earlier. The sales pitch is that this is to help kids be happier, right? It's the leftists will tell us that this is helping children to be who they really are, really by denying their actual biology. But let's just pretend for a moment that these things were all true. When you look at the studies, and there's a great study actually coming out later today from Dr. Hilary Cass, a pediatrician in the UK, who has been the lead person in a study commissioned by the National Health Service to look into all of this. And in England, they've banned puberty blockers for these kids. Mm -hmm. It wasn't mm -hmm. the politicians doing it, it was the pediatricians. And in this report that's going to come out tomorrow, actually later tonight, it will say that even treating a child as though they're the opposite sex with a new name and new pronouns is causing grave psychological harm. There's absolutely no evidence that these kids are becoming happier because we tell them that they're the opposite sex. Just the social transition, never mind the puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones and surgeries, is doing a ton of harm. And if you just slow down for a second and think about it, it makes a lot of sense. If you tell a girl that she's really a boy, that she's a he, him, what message are you sending that child? You're telling her that she's supposed to be something she's not, that she was born wrong. That's extraordinarily psychologically abusive. And then when that gets reaffirmed thousands of times throughout the school year by everyone in the school and all the teachers and all the administrators and everyone else in your life, well, my gosh, this child is constantly getting this message that she was supposed to be something she's not. And what's really going on with these kids? It's frequently that these kids have autism. A lot of them have been sexually abused. These are a lot of kids who would just grow up to be gay. You know, they don't conform to the typical stereotypes that we associate with each sex. These are kids in state care. These are just kids who have struggles of some sort, and those aren't being treated. They're being treated as though gender is the underlying source of all their problems. And activists have been telling medical bodies how to do their jobs. It's been interesting to watch a lot of the detransitioners speaking up now and saying exactly what you've just articulated, that some of them were abused as children. Some of them were so mentally ill when they were, you know, 12. And they weren't treated for that necessarily. They, you know, had this gender dysphoria and had the gender, quote unquote, gender affirming care. And we all, starting from maybe 10, 11, 12, start to go through puberty, which is a hellish stretch, but it is a stretch nonetheless that is part of biology. And I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed at two things. Parents who just want to kind of, coddle their kids and just give them what they want to answer this very complex question. And then the doctors who will do these procedures. Let's start with the parents. Where do you think parents get it wrong here when they decide that, you know, I mean, my, if my kid came to me and said, mom, I think the best thing for me would just be to eat cake for dinner every night for the rest of my life. There's no way I would say anything to make you happy kid. So how is this happening? Right. So there's a couple of different things going on here. There are parents who are pushing this on their kids. And then there are parents who resist this, but are being coerced by gender clinics, being told that you can have a live daughter or a dead son, for example, mm -hmm. like as though your child is going to kill themselves if we don't transition them. But this has been presented as a virtuous thing. And it's really being pushed by the far left who have come to this idea that some children are born in the wrong body. This is pseudoscientific nonsense. This is like a quasi religion as though we have a gendered soul inside of our body. If a girl doesn't conform to stereotypes or a boy, beautiful. If a girl wants to climb trees and play in the dirt and chase lizards and ride a dirt bike and throw around a football, she's a beautiful girl. We all knew this forever. Tomboys are not actual boys, but now these kids and they're having struggles and puberty can be hard, especially for girls. Obviously they're getting sexualized by men. Their bodies are changing. Boys just kind of get bigger and faster and stronger. It can be hard for them too, though, of course. But now we're treating just actual normal teenage angst as though this is a sign that the child was born wrong. That is so abusive. This whole thing is nonsense. If an adult wants to transition, that's a totally different conversation. Even then with these 18 and 19 and 20 year olds who are on the autism spectrum and have been sexually abused, they should still be looking for abuse and trauma and treating all these other things first. Doctors aren't just order takers, like they work in a drive through and someone orders right. a Big Mac and they just hand it out. They shouldn't right. just be handing out mastectomies like they're taking an order at a restaurant. They right. have a, a sworn an oath to first do no harm and they're violating that oath.
Yeah, uh, it, it is astonishing. Um, these doctors that are willing to do this, you mentioned in Europe or in the UK, they have banned the puberty blockers. Bravo. I hope that it becomes more widespread because aren't there studies as well, Chris, that these, you know, it, it was promised that, uh, you know, once we stop the puberty blockers, puberty will just pick right up again. There will be no long term side effects. That's been disproven, hasn't it? Exactly. So there are two main lies. There's that lie that puberty blockers are reversible, but time isn't reversible. The sales pitch has always been that puberty blockers buy the child time to explore their gender identity. But as this report that's coming out from the NHS shows, and as the gender clinic's own statistics show, if you leave the kids alone, they grow out of this phase. All the studies we have before we started giving kids puberty blockers, there are about 12 academic studies. They're all up on my website, billboardchris.com. But they show that the most recent one, for example, showed 88% of these kids simply grew out of their gender dysphoria, and a majority grew up to be gay. This is harming kids who would grow up to be gay, and this is blocking the cure, because the cure is puberty itself. Yeah. Now we block it, and we don't give these children a chance to grow up and out of this. So yes, time isn't reversible. If you put kids on puberty blockers for five or six years for the duration of their puberty, they don't, don't get to go back to being 11 again, or they'll go through those years. Those years are gone. And the other lie about the suicide lie is that if this is the, really the only way you can sort of justify this child abuse is to say that, well, we don't really have a choice because all these kids are going to kill themselves. It's a total fallacy. The only study we ever have into this just came out in the last month from Finland. And they looked at more than 2,000 kids who went to the gender clinics and they compared them to a control group of more than 17,000. Over 21 years of this study, there were only seven suicides. The actual suicide rate in any given year was 0.051%. And there was really no difference between these kids waiting to be seen at the gender clinic or the kids in the control group. The common denominator for the slight uptick in suicides was just other mental health distress. Mm -hmm. So let's treat them for these other conditions and let's stop coercing people to go along with this by selling this really abusive, coercive lie that kids are going to kill themselves. It's just terrible. You know, the, the, the mutilation, um, and it is an appropriate word here, um, uh, it's, it's really terrifying. I have seen what happens. But for those who haven't, um, and maybe if you could just describe what, the, what kind of mutilation kids are put through in order to accommodate sort of these extreme, you know, I really do want a penis, or I really don't want to want breasts, or I don't want my penis. I mean, it, uh, it's graphic, but it's, yeah. it's disturbing. Yes. So for a long time, people didn't believe this, but we have all the evidence in the world. And I've tweeted out videos of these trans health professionals themselves admitting to this. So for example, Kellen Lackhart is a woman now identifying as a man. She's the psychiatrist at Kaiser Permanente in Oakland, California. This is the same clinic that cut off the breasts of Chloe Cole, who has been testifying in legislatures all across the country. But she admitted on camera that they have cut off the breasts of a girl as young as 12 years old, and they've done what are called vaginoplasties on 16-year-old boys, having started the process when they were 15. So that's where they castrate a boy, they slice open the penis, and they invert it to form what's called a neovagina. But because these kids were on puberty blockers, the boys, their penis never grew, so they don't have enough tissue to do this inversion. In that case, they will cut out some of the child's colon or some of their peritoneum, the lining of their abdominal cavity, to form the lining of this neovagina. And of course, there are surgical complications. One child died during this surgery. And my gosh, what are we doing? Cutting off the breasts of 12, 13, 14-year-old girls. They're just little kids, really. really. Layla Jane is another girl who at 13 years old in one month had her breasts cut off at that clinic. She's now suing. Harmeet Dillon is her lawyer. Harmeet Dillon ran to be the chair of the RNC. And, you know, even mainstream publications like Reuters have reported on all these numbers. There are thousands of kids getting surgeries. Most of them are double mastectomies. Tens of thousands getting puberty blockers. And double that for the kids who are getting the opposite sex's hormones. And those cause grave harm as well. A girl on testosterone for four or five years has to get a hysterectomy because it causes vaginal and uterine atrophy. Sometimes they're cutting out their ovaries as well, so now they can never produce estrogen for the rest of their life. We're sending teenaged girls into menopause and calling it love and kindness. Yeah. 
At the very heart of our democracy lies a principle we hold sacred, and that is free speech. It is the cornerstone that supports every freedom we cherish. Yet in today's digital age, discussions about our wealth, our rights, and our future are being silenced or overshadowed in mainstream narratives. And that leaves many feeling voiceless in conversations crucial to our financial independence and security. Now, this is where wealth protection research steps in, armed with a mission that's never been more critical. Wealth protection research is not a financial advisory firm. They are defenders of free speech committed to giving a voice to the silenced. Wealth protection research tirelessly seeks out financial experts. These are the voices that challenge prevailing narratives, especially as we navigate the uncertainties of the 2024 election. Wealth Protection Research has created a 2024 Election Wealth Protection Report. This free report highlights the three best ideas for protecting and growing your money heading into the 2024 election. It contains ideas the mainstream media won't touch, and listeners can get it completely free. Text IDEAS to 76626 to claim your free copy. If you believe in the sanctity of free speech, and the importance of financial freedom, then act right now. Text IDEAS to 76626 to claim your free copy of this 2024 election protection report. It's time to widen the scope of what we're told, to hear the ideas the establishment does not think you can handle, and take control of our financial destinies. Text IDEAS to 76626 to claim your free copy. There is a woman named Laura Becker who has been on our show once before, and she will be on again. Uh, I think she's writing a book now. Um, And she she very clearly told us um, she had the mastectomy, double mastectomy, uh, when she was young, that she wasn't treated for her mental issues, but that they thought that all of this other stuff would fix it. Now she wants to fall in love, get married to a male, and have children, and she's not sure if she can. Um, I, I'm not sure what her legal recourse is, but I think these lawsuits are going to make a difference. I think they're going to have to. Uh, we, we've got to get our heads around the fact that this is happening, that it's not compassionate, that it's hurting. And so you, I, I love people who are brave, Chris, and you have shown a tremendous amount of courage. Your nickname is Billboard Chris because you've walked around in some pretty unfriendly, hostile environments wearing billboards. How did you get that idea? I know I look ridiculous, but it works. So the first thing I did was I actually put up real billboards. I put up a billboard in Vancouver that said the very controversial, I love J.K. Rowling, the Harry Potter author. I love her too. And I followed the lead of this woman in the UK named Kelly J. Keene, who put up a poster at the Edinburgh train station that said that it got taken down after one day because some people online said it was hate speech. And so part of this for me is we should be able to have conversations. We should be able to talk about anything, but when kids are coming to irreversible harm, we need to be having a lot of conversations about that. So I just got tired of people not feeling free to talk. So I put up that huge billboard. It got taken down after one day. A Vancouver politician said it was hate speech. I then put up a whole bunch more all throughout the U.S. in September of 2020. But then in Canada, where I was stuck because of COVID, we couldn't even leave the country. No sign companies would work with me. So I said, forget them. They might be able to take down my billboard, but they can't take one off my back. So I had some signs made and I started going outside downtown Vancouver. Then I started traveling the country, just having conversations with people. And I record those. I put them online to help educate others how to speak about this issue. And I felt I had to get out of our echo chambers online into the real world because most people aren't following this conversation on Twitter or whatever. So it's been really successful. I now travel the U.S. and the world. And I'm just going to keep going until this child abuse is a thing of the past. I mean, this is... This is a sacrifice you're making. How do your daughters feel about this? My my daughters, of course, are very proud of their dad. It's a sacrifice for everyone because I am home the majority of the time, but I'm gone for a period of time every month, usually on a couple trips. So for sure, it's a sacrifice for everyone. But they understand exactly what I'm doing. They know this is important. And they get it. So I still, you know, FaceTime over FaceTime every night, and I still take books on the road and read to them at night and things like that. But they're getting a bit older. They're 12 and 14. So I try to be home for the weekends. They're busy during the week anyway, during sports and doing diving and all sorts of stuff. So oh, that, it's, it's, it's not too it's, So they're at that age, too, where this is really, in, in they're at the moment 
of when so many of these young women and young men decide, I can't, I, I'm so depressed. I don't want to be in my body anymore. Uh, for me, it was, I, you know, I, I was an anorexic. I lost a ton of weight. I tiptoed at the line of death because I was so malnourished as a teenager because I hated my body. Um, so that was my way of controlling it. Uh, fortunately, I got some help and I got out of that. Um, I think this notion that we can make life perfect and and to order, like you said, like yeah, I'll have a I'll have a couple of breasts, please, or you know, mm-hmm. like it's fast order food that we can do it this way is is kind of a, this idea that seems to be permeating society. Like life has to be perfect because everyone online sure seems happy. Why am I not that happy? You know, why am I right. not smiling all the time and showing off my beautiful body? Uh, maybe it's because I have a body I'm not that comfortable with yet. And and puberty is that time when you really are awkward. Um, what is what is giving you hope right now about your efforts and, and this movement? Great question. So I've always had 100% confidence how this is going to go. This is too crazy to last. This is a social contagion. Dr. Phil made a great point when he was on with Joe Rogan. He said, starting around 2010, kids stopped living their own lives and they started watching other kids living their lives with the advent of the smartphone. Yeah. So it's just been catastrophic for children's mental health. But this was something that really grew in silence, this whole movement of gender ideology transitioning kids. None of the mainstream media would report on it. And it's only in silence that it was able to grow because I knew as soon as parents learn what's going on, that a lot of them will start to fight back and speak up and the truth will get out there. The ideologues pushing this have tried to confuse everyone and they've lied. They've just outright lied about everything associated with this. And the truth is coming out now. So they might have a lot of money and government backing and whatever, but we have the truth and the truth spreads for free. So we're just going to keep spreading it. And I know for every 1000 people I talk to out on the street, I sometimes quote this speech that Javier Mille gave, the new president in Argentina. He said he's not here to guide sheep. He's here to awaken lions. And it's the same thing for me. I know there will be two or three people out of those 1,000 who get active themselves in fighting back. And a great example of that is this law firm out of Texas. It's called Campbell Miller Payne. These are four dads with 17 kids between them who all left their previous law firms and started one just to represent these detransitioners because they felt called to do it. And they now have about a dozen lawsuits going and one of the greatest ways to put an end to this, of course, is through lawfare because you got to yeah. hit these people in the pocketbooks. Yeah, I, 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 I really hope we come to see the truth in all of this, and that we we can stop just calling people transphobes because th- they care about these individuals and this social contagion that you mentioned. Uh, but people like you are willing to take the slings and the arrows. I'm sure you've been called every name in the book, Chris, um, but I just call you courageous and I I think you're doing the right thing. You're a man of integrity and we're so lucky to have you out there fighting the good fight. Um, Is there one particular moment of being Billboard Chris out there that stands out to you among the rest where maybe you were cheered or maybe where you were jeered? (laughs) There have been so many crazy moments. I've had my arm broken by Antifa. I got jumped by six people in on St. Catherine Street in Montreal way back in 2021. And I blocked this traffic cone. This man was swinging at my head four times, but the base on those things is pretty thick. So it broke my forearm. I've been arrested twice in front of police even one time just for walking peacefully on a street. Police told me I wasn't allowed to walk into the public square in Vancouver, British Columbia. With that billboard. Because Antifa people were attacking me. Yeah, I actually had a sign that said gender ideology does not belong in schools. And one that said, I love JK Rowling back then. Normally my messages are children cannot consent to puberty blockers and my definition of a dad, which is a human male who protects his kids from gender ideology. But I've been mobbed by a couple hundred university students. I've been assaulted probably 35 times, but that's the crazy stuff that goes really viral. Normally I'm just having nice, beautiful conversations with people. And when I think about what I do, I just think about all those hours by myself before anyone knew I existed just having one conversation at a time because I knew I was living a purpose-driven life, reaching parents who would then be able to protect their kids. And I'm happy when I'm out there on the streets. I don't care about the violence. That just backfires. If someone wants to come and punch me in the face, honestly, 
I welcome it because that'll just get seen millions of times and it'll wake up a bunch more people. And the type of people, the type of men who don't like what I'm doing, they're not the type who punch hard anyway. So I don't have too much to worry about. <laughs> wow. You just said that. That is awesome. Um, and I'll ask you this conversely. It, has there been a conversation where you actually felt like maybe you opened someone's eyes? Oh, this happens all the time. One that immediately comes to mind was an 80 minute conversation I had outside the University of Pennsylvania. A gay black man rode by me on his bike yelling all sorts of obscenities. And sometimes with the men, I'll challenge them a little to come back. You know, what are you doing running away? Come have a conversation. And to his credit, he did. He was having this adrenaline dump. His face was literally ticking. He was shaking a little bit because a lot of people are just really overwhelmed that I even dare to challenge this whole narrative. But over the course of 80 minutes, he completely calmed down. I said a whole bunch of things he agreed with, of course, like children are beautiful just as they are. And a lot of these kids would just grow up to be gay. What are we doing telling them that they were born wrong just because they're a bit different? And by the end, he was agreeing with everything I said. And he shared some very personal things as well off camera um, that were very moving. So these things happen all the time. I get emails from people from a year before where they thought I was some sort of devil. And now they've come to understand what's going on. So I know it's working, but I also know that 99% of the conversations I generate, I'm not a part of. So I'm generating ripples, which lead out there, and you never know what good comes from that. I just got goosebumps when you said that. Um, I, I hope my listeners do too. And I congratulate you. Uh, I, I thank you for having the courage. I mean, seriously, it is in short supply, Chris, you know that. Um, and so, I, but I do firmly believe um, in that notion that you're not out there to, to lead sheep, you're out there to, to, you know, waken some waken lions. lions and, yeah. and, and I love that. Um, I always say at the end of my podcast, be brave and do good. And you are doing both of those things exponentially well. Uh, so I thank you for your time and for what you're doing. I, I applaud you again. You can find him at billboard Chris on X. And is there an Instagram handle too? Yeah, it's the same. I've got a website. I'll be making it better soon, but it's got all the basics. It's billboardchris.com. People can support me through there if they want. But yeah, I'm just going to keep going. Please follow along. Please get yourself educated. That's the main thing we all need to do to protect our own kids and to educate people in our friend and family circles so they can talk about this too. Chris, thank you very, very much. I hope to talk my, to you again. My pleasure. Thank you, Michelle. We will see you next time. Don't forget to be brave and do good.